It's all happened so fast. Seems like just yesterday we were gazing upon that newborn babe in the manger at Bethlehem. And then Ash Wednesday came crashing upon us. And then, just when we were getting into our Lenten groove and into that good wrestling with our Lenten practice, trying, failing, trying again, Holy Week came barreling down upon us. And oh, what a ride this last week has been. As the old wide, wide world of sports opening used to say, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. That ages you. <laughs> Jim McKay. We pinned all of our hopes on our king as he came riding down the Mount of Olives on that colt. And there was that powerful meal we shared with him on Thursday night. And then it all went so horribly, horribly wrong. Humanity's shadow side on full display. Betrayal, denial, fear, political expediency, and just plain cruelty. These took center stage. And around the edges there were other qualities. Courage, tender, loving care, steadfastness. These nobler aspects that can emerge in us and take us by surprise, these were also on full display. And then it was done. He breathed his last. And that was that. But that is never that. The women knew that. And so on the first day of the week, just as the dawn was breaking and the early morning mist was rising off the cobblestone streets, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee, they came to the tomb with the spices they had prepared. They would do that last act of love that was required of them. You see, it had all happened so fast, there'd been no time to do the right thing when he died. And then they had to wait until the Sabbath was done. It had to have been hard, that waiting. Longing to do right by the one you loved and having to wait. And in that waiting time, they had poured all their love and sorrow into the preparation of the spices and ointments they would use to anoint his precious body. There was the matter of that huge stone that sealed the tomb. But that wasn't even on their radar. Good morning. <laughs> They were only focused on the ritual ahead of them. But when they got there, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. A little odd, but okay. But when they went in, they did not find the body. And that undid them. Oh, the text says... While they were perplexed about this, hello, try what it means in the Greek, to be without resources, to be in straits, to be left wanting, to be embarrassed, to be in doubt, not to know which way to turn, to be at a loss with oneself, not to know how to, how to decide or what to do. That's what the women were feeling. It had all come to a horrible, horrible end. But they knew how to do death. They knew the rituals. And there would be comfort in that. 
But a tomb with no body? Nothing had prepared them for this. Bad enough to lose their beloved Lord. To know that they would never again gaze upon Him or hear His voice or enjoy a shared meal or a shared silence. But a tomb with no body? They were completely and utterly without orientation whatsoever. Ever been there? Ever been in a situation where you were without resources and consumed with doubt? A time when you didn't, just didn't know which way to turn and where you were at a loss with yourself? A space where you just didn't know what to do or even how to decide? Welcome to the empty tomb. Suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes. I mean, they looked fabulous. <laughs> Suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. These two men, they were present to the women. And maybe this is the first piece of gospel we need to hear this morning. When we are at our most perplexed, God sends us messengers who have the capacity to simply be present to us. And that holy presence both comforts and terrifies us. The women, they went with terror. And their eyes did what my eyes would probably do when I am thrown into deep, deep fear. They hit the ground. Now, biblical messengers generally pro proclaim a consistent and constant message, which is, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. But not these two dazzling men. They simply ask the women this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. Interesting, but some ancient manuscripts lack that second part, he is not here, but has risen. The message to the women could have been quite simply, why do you look for the living among the dead? And this living isn't just the respirations kind of living, but it's life at its most complete, fullest. Zao, real life, true life, active, blessed, endless life, vital life, strong and full of power. This is the abundant life that Jesus describes in John's Gospel. So why do we look for the living among the dead? Why is it so hard to get our eyes off of the tomb floor and see that resurrection is everywhere? Why is it so hard to move out of these places of death that are destroying all of us right now the world over? Why are we individually and collectively looking for real life true life, deep, abundant, vital life amidst patterns and actions and words that only and always lead to death. The dazzling messengers continue. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that this is how it would go? that the Son of Humanity must be handed over to all the forces of separation in this world and must be crucified so that all the stuff that's tearing us apart could die with Him and on the third day rise again. Remember? 
Then they remembered his words. And maybe that is the res resurrection that we need to believe in. Right now, right here, on this day in our time. We need to remember his words. We need to remember his promise. We need to remember that he has reconciled what could not be reconciled. That he holds together all that would fly apart. That his power and life are stronger than the forces of death. That his love is stronger than the violence that would kill it. Maybe our first act of resurrection living is to believe that that love really does come again. And stones really do get rolled away. And the life that rises this day in Jesus, in us, really can lead us out of our tombs of death. And when they remembered his words, the women returned from the tomb and told all this to the eleven and all the rest. And quite a band of women it was. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women. We're talking the sisterhood here. But these words seemed to the apostles an idle tale. And they did not believe them. The apostles, that inner circle of men, they did not believe the women or their words. They called their words an idle tale. Leros. Twaddle, it's sometimes called. Isn't that a great word? <laughs> Nonsense. The apostles just couldn't lean in. They couldn't trust. And at least in that moment, they couldn't remember. The text goes on to tell how Peter got up and ran to the tomb and checked it out and found those linen claws by themselves i.e. no body. And then how he went home amazed at what had happened. But again, this is one of those verses that a lot of manuscripts lack. It is quite possible that none of the apostles could leave the grips of grief and fear that had consumed them to go and see that empty tomb. And that is the challenge of this day. We hear these words of the women. And how do we respond? Do we dismiss it as an idle tale? Amidst all the death that surrounds us on so many levels in so many ways, amidst all the oppositions of conflict and hate that is constricting our life and sealing us away from one another. Can we dare to believe that big stones really can get rolled away? And that it is possible to remember another way? And that it is possible to remember His way? That it is possible to remember that the way of love and life cannot, will not be denied. Can we wonder at amazement at this? Or will we simply stay sealed away in our little apostle enclave and ruminate on all the death washing over our world and continue our mourning rites? It starts with remembering. It starts with awakening. It starts with lifting our eyes to look for the living in all those places and all those spaces where resurrection is already dancing, calling back to us, beckoning us, come and follow. Maybe it's best to let the poet 
have a go at it this morning. George Herbert, Anglican priest and poet, penned this in 1633. He called it the dawning. Awake, sad heart, whom sorrow ever drowns. Take up thine eyes which feed on earth. Unfold thy forehead gathered into frowns. Thy Savior comes and with him mirth. Awake, awake, and with a thankful heart his comforts take. But thou dost still lament and pine and cry and feel his death but not his victory. Arise, sad heart, if thou dost not withstand, Christ's resurrection thine may be. Do not by hanging down break from the hand, which as it riseth, raiseth thee. Arise, arise, and with his burial linen dry thine eyes. Christ left his grave clothes that we might, when grief draws tears or blood, not want a handkerchief. It's time to awaken. It's time to remember. It's time to stop looking for the living among the dead. Jesus has been raised. It's time to raise our eyes, take his hand, and walk into life again.